Thanks for tuning in today. We are going to talk about making a programmer for your Crawlmaster Mini ESCs. Today I'm going to walk through the assembly and use of a programmer for the Crawlmaster ESC controller. Why would you need to use that? Well, first, you would probably need that to update your firmware. Matter of fact, it's not just a you may need it, you actually do need it. First, let's go over the things that you need to build this up. From Adafruit, I have this little USB to serial device, the friend they call it. It is part number CP2104. I believe they call it the uh, UART friend or the serial friend, something like that. It just says friend on the board, but uh, if you search for the part number, it'll come up. We also need some quarter watt resistors. You can get anywhere from 4.7K to a 10K on there. And we also need a signal diode. The signal diode that I'm using from Adafruit is the 1N4148 signal diode. And that's part number P1641. And what we do is, you can see on this little diagram here, we put that together in between the TX and the RX on the board, and what it does is it converts this little guy to a one-wire programmer. That means that it has both TX and RX on one wire going back and forth, but you do also have to have a ground. So it's a, you know, maybe a little bit of a misnomer because it's actually a two-wire setup. But otherwise, we'd have to have three wires to get the job done, and this gets it done with just two, or one wire if you want to call it what they call it in the industry. So we need that. We also need a soldering iron, we need our safety glasses, and we will need the world's longest screwdriver. Mostly just for making jokes today. So we'll set that aside. Somewhere, wherever it's gonna sit, I guess I'm gonna have to go down here. It's so long, there's nowhere to put it. So the first thing we need to do is solder on our parts. And of course, warm up our soldering iron. I am using the a U A Yahweh 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 9378 soldering station. Really like this guy. It has been a tank for me and the fatter tip just works good. Now for really small work like this, the small tip is actually kind of or the big tip is actually a little difficult to work with. But if you got a little bit of patience and maybe a little bit of skill with this, it is not that big deal. So, in between the TX and the RX, we need the diode, I guess it would be called biased, towards the TX pin. And that is going to be the little black band, as maybe you can pick up on this. So the little black band goes towards the TX on the chip. So let's just take a look here. We are going to shove it in the, the TXD right there. And then the other side of it goes into the RX. So a little black band going towards the TX. And the other one going towards the RX. There we go. Just like so. Then in that same RX, as you can see on the other side, we have the 10K resistor. And I'm actually using a 4.7K resistor because I had some around. And there is no bias on these, so it really doesn't matter which way they are installed. And then we're gonna go over and jump to the three volt, the 3.3 volt. Just like so. Once we get those installed, we need to solder them in. So we shall do that next. We do need to make sure that there are no shorts because if you look, there's little bitty capacitors on here and there would be a chance that the leg of this resistor touches those. So we just wanna make sure that everything is kind of bent out of the way. If you really wanted to, you could put all these components on the back of the board. It really doesn't matter where they are installed, just that they are installed. Oh, and you will need a set of clippers or nippers, flush cutters, however you would like to call them. So we solder these in. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. Here we go, one and done. You want to make sure that the solder has a nice connection with the pad underneath. A, a nice fillet, if you will. There we go. And since these have gold-plated pads, it flows on it pretty nicely, pretty easily. And I'm just using the corner of my soldering iron, since it's such an oversized tip for this job. It gets it done. 
Here we go, flow a little bit in there. There we go, you can see where it is right now. Now I will cut those off. A one. A two. Oh, watch your eyes. Three. Oh, I'm sorry. Three. Three. Now we have those top parts soldered on. The next thing that we need to do is to put a little header. And this header needs to be where we can shove the pins into our RX and a power so that we can power it up and actually program the ESC. So I'm gonna break this header, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six wide. There we go. And then I'm going to solder it to the end, just like so. And we'll just go at it front to back, or back to front. Oop. Yeah, and maybe you don't want to use the big beefy tip like I'm doing. It's uh, not the easiest job, but once you get into a good rhythm with it, it's, it's not so bad. There we go. Got those. Oh, went on this little, little cold solder joint, so we'll fix that one up. And the rest of them look good. Perfect. And that is the build. It's not so bad. It's, it'd be a little easier if I, I didn't just free float it on the desk. It's a, it's a little tricky to solder when it, it goes around like that. But there we go. Now, we will need to install the driver from Scilabs on this. So let's pick up the computer. I will just tell you which one it is. But with a Windows 10 computer, you should be able to just have it auto detect and install the drivers for you. However, if it doesn't, then the drivers that you will use are the CP210X Universal Windows drivers from Scilabs. And essentially what you'll do is you'll go into your device manager, you will click on the device when you plug it in via USB, it'll have a little exclamation point on it, and you will search for the drivers on your computer. And what I suggest is that you just select the entire folder itself and let Windows do the work. Don't try to guess at which folder the right drivers are in because we did that and it didn't work out so well. But this guy should be ready to go. So. What we need to do is open up the configurator tool. It's an AM32 one, and mine is called the crawler connector, but this is kind of a, a prototype one. When you open it up, ESC config tool 1.70 Holmes Hobbies Crawler Edition. And what I am going to do is update the firmware on the ESC. To do that, we will need to power the ESC as well from an external source. There are ways we're considering to make it power up from the USB, but it's a little tricky, so we're not quite there yet. All right, so first off, I need to plug in the little device that we just soldered up. And hopefully, when we plug it in, we're gonna see the serial port status show us that something is selectable. Because right now, before I plug this in, it's just serial port. There's nothing to select. And since we are using a single device, a single channel device, we do not select the connect with flight connector right there. So um, if you're using something like a flight controller that had four channels on it, you would check this box first, but we are not. So we don't do that. Plug this in. I can't hear if it went doo 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 because I am currently plugged into another, another device, but hey, COM6. All right, we select COM6 and then the connect button right here. And yes, bam, connected to COM6. The next thing we do is we plug in the controller. All right, so we need to plug ground in to the ground. We have the six pin header that we just put on. We plug our ground into the ground. And on the ESC, you can use the little JST that comes pre-installed, at least on the ready to runs. We plug the ground into the ground. And then we plug our signal wire, which is either gonna be a white or a yellow, 
into the TX pin, which is the second from the other side. So we will have three exposed pins in between. And did I count that wrong earlier? No, okay, there's four, there's six total pins, six total pins. So there we go. Maybe not the easiest arrangement right now, but this is kind of an early stage product, so it is not exactly the cleanest in some ways. Now we need to power it up. Gonna power it up. And finally, we can either hit read settings here, and let's just see, is it gonna read, is it gonna connect? It connected and it read. This is success. And what I need to do on this one, because this one has the old firmware with the temperature rollback a little bit too low, we need to update it. We have this binary file listed on the website. You can actually go to the product page and download the binary itself. So we can go to the flash tab of our programmer. We go to load firmware. And I know it is one, whoops, one up. Here we go, program suite. Crawlmaster Mini 175 Fahrenheit fixed is what it says on my side. On your side, it will show as the uh, 1.1 firmware for the Crawlmaster Mini. So we double select that, and then we hit flash firmware. And this takes a little bit of time. Some of these devices are faster than others. If you're using a flight controller, sometimes one of the channels is gonna be the fastest out of them all. I was using a Hobbywing flight controller and channel number four was blazing fast. One, two, and three, not at all. If I tried to do more than one device, so if I tried to flash four at one time, it was blisteringly slow. So it does take a little bit of time but we're flashing the entire binary. We're not just updating settings on here. So this has to uh, write the entire thing and it does do a checksum while it is in action. I believe that's what it's called, maybe a little bit out of my area for expertise, but once it's done, it'll say flash success right here. And then we can go back to our settings. We can read our settings. Nothing should actually change on that. Okay, yes, it actually did change. It, it read the settings and did a better job of reading it because the original firmware we had on this wasn't quite uh, compatible is the best way to put it. So if you need to reverse the rotation of your motor and you can't just switch two wires out, you can just hit the reverse rotation button. Complementary PWM on here actually will give us a better low speed startup. Variable PWM well, it's, uh, it's kind of the same. Some of these, I'm gonna have to do a separate video on really describing is, is what's what. Bidirectional means that you have forwards and reverse operation, and we want that in a crawler. These are all the stock settings that should be on there. Stuck rotor protection, if you want it to shut off, if you get into an object and it starts to stall, after a few moments, it'll actually just let off the throttle for you if that happens. Brake on stop, that is drag brake. When we are stopped, we want that for a crawler. The stall protection, that is actually a, a, a low speed bump, if you will. When you get into an object and it starts to load down the motor, the stall protection keeps it from stalling. So it's not a protection if you're stalling, it is actually almost a push to keep the motor going, which is kind of neat. The sinusoidal startup, is a way to force our motor to go slower than the inherent speed wants it to go. So on every motor, there is an inherent speed that it wants to start up. There's a minimum speed. And typically there's gonna be a trade-off between having better drag brake and having a smoother startup. That's always how I've had to engineer motors. Uh, a smoother starting motor, let's say a six pole versus a four pole motor. The six pole would have better smoother startup in some ways but it's gonna lose some torque density, it's gonna lose some drag brake, and it's kinda, of, you know, you've got that hard choice to make as a motor designer, or at least I do, of course, as a motor designer. The sinusoidal startup gets around that and forces the motor to move slower than its minimum speed. So for the majority of crawlers, you're actually gonna want that sinusoidal startup to be selected. It is stock on here, so that's that. Uh, 30 millisecond telemetry. Right now, I don't believe we actually have telemetry functions uh, coming out of this ESC. So 
you can try it out if you want. I don't know how to use it because I'm not a heli guy yet, but it is there. And in the future, we may be able to have some pretty good data streaming. Use hall sensors on a firmware that you'll be able to get into the future, the one that uh, that will actually work. On the binary that fixes just the temperature, it does not work. But on ones that I'm currently testing in beta right now, or I guess it'd be alpha technically, it, it, it is, uh, it's in testing. So that is a feature that will be enabled in the future. Uh, timing advance, it is what it is. That's something that you will have to test, but the stock setting works pretty good. The motor KV, the motor poles, that kind of works with a sinusoidal startup. We're still working on integrating that a little bit better. Startup power, that actually is the minimum speed of your motor. So if you want it to start faster with a little bit better punch, a little bit less stall, then you would increase your startup power. If you want it to go a little bit slower, then you would reduce that startup power. I don't actually recommend that that is changed right now, but it's something that you can test and tweak with. Beat volume, exactly what it is. Some motors are louder than others. So if you need to be able to hear that arming a little bit better, you can turn your beat volume up. Drag brake power is what it says. Uh, a stronger drag brake is stronger drag brake. A less drag brake is less drag brake. We're in a crawler, so drag brake at 10 is probably what we want. And the sti sign start up ramp. Let's see if I can get this. Uh, we'll have to we'll have to do a little bit of tuning on the way that this looks. That's not quite opening up for us. But the the sign start up ramp, I believe it is called, or range. There it goes that is how far in your throttle the sign startup lasts. So if you want a more gentle throttle that's less touchy, then you'll actually put more range in here. And if you want a, uh, a, a more touchy throttle, then you would reduce that amount. So I'm gonna go back to where the stock was. I believe that was at 14. And uh, let's see, let's just read, make sure everything is yeah, I didn't change any settings at all. I don't care if you if you did want to change some settings, then you would hit the save button down here and it would save it. Let's go ahead and save right to EEPROM successful. That's how long it takes once you have that initial binary rewritten on there. So pretty quick. I hope that explains it all. We're going to have to go through and do a more in depth on the actual testing and tweaking and tuning of this in the future. But for now, that should let you know what does what and just exactly how to make both the programmer and how to install the new binary file if you don't want to send yours in for that low temperature cutoff tweak. If you do have any questions about it, I will not only do my best to respond to this one, but this one will be a high priority video for me. So I will definitely be doing my best to respond to all the questions. And if you do, let's let's work through it. This is, uh, this is pretty fun for me, this, uh, this new product here. So we unplug our ESC from the power, then we can unplug our ESC from the programmer. We unplug our USB from the computer and we are good to go. So I do hope that helps. In the future, we will be definitely releasing the firmware upgrades as they are needed. There's not a whole lot to change, but I'm sure we'll think of something. As always, thanks for tuning in. Have a good day.